Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third Community Conversations. We're happy that you could be with us to discuss a very timely and important topic, what K-12 education in San Antonio might look like in the fall of 2020. I am Margo Deli Carpini. I am the Vice Provost for Strategic Educational Partnerships and the Dean of the College of Education at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And I will be your moderator today. To frame our conversation, I just wanted to add a little bit of context about what we'll be talking about today and what we'd like to focus on. We have experienced a very abrupt shift from traditional educational context to remote learning this spring. The impact of the global pandemic on education is great. Over a billion students worldwide are unable to go to school or university due to measures to stop the spread of COVID-19. The pandemic is expected to have a huge impact on global education. The National Council of State Legislatures share how schools in the United States have shifted operations across their offerings related to everything from providing school meal programs to standardized testing and accountability to instructional time and what that means in this remote learning environment, meeting the needs of students with disabilities and issues related to college readiness and admissions. Nationally and here in San Antonio, the shift has illuminated the disparities that exist in our pre-K through 12th grade students and those in higher education. Caregivers have suddenly become homeschoolers and teachers at all levels have had to shift their instructional practices to a remote format. The COVID-19 pandemic is revealing greater inequities and if these are not addressed, they will have very negative impacts to many of our communities that have been denied access, creating an even greater divide. Families with no computers or devices and no or limited internet have been especially vulnerable as a result of this shift. Schools here in the city have made their parking lots into internet hotspots and districts have tried to ensure that their students have devices in order to access instruction. Teachers have had to completely shift their instructional practices and delivery to ensure student success and access in a very different learning environment and one that they may have had limited preparation to be successful in. Poly policies are not in place to address all of these issues. The abrupt shift this spring that has moved remote learning into the center of our focus has required us to examine the principles and practices, both from the student perspective and the teacher perspective, and it's resulted in a close examination of our traditional understandings of teaching, learning, policy, and best practices. As we enter the summer months and plan for what the educational landscape will look like for the 2021 academic year, many questions have been raised, including how do we prepare teachers and other professionals to operate in these environments? What are the benefits and limits of remote or distance learning? How do we ensure quality? What are the impacts to students and educators as a result of this shift to remote instruction? What are the impacts on the mental health of our students? What are we learning about the digital divide and how do we address this as, as a society as we move forward? And in a world where we have to move quickly and make these shifts from traditional face-to-face -face learning to remote experiences and then perhaps back again, what are the policies that we need to have in place to ensure quality, equity, and efficacy? The long-term impacts are not only related to how K-12 schools and teaching and learning and school professional preparation responds to these changes, but to college admissions, teacher shortages, the culture of our educational system, and the larger impact of how our students learn, how they view teaching and learning, how they socialize and interact, and all of these things will be impacted in ways that we don't yet understand. But today we can begin to ask and answer some of these questions. We have a panel of experts on topics ranging from educational policy, equity in education, educational disparities, to issues related to the mental health and well being of our students as they navigate this new normal. I'd like to introduce our panelists. They include Dr. Michael Verreal. He is an assistant professor in the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Department and the director of the Urban Education Institute at UTSA. Dr. Anne Marie Ryan, professor and department chair in the Department of Interdisciplinary Learning and Teaching. Dr. Vanessa Sansone, 
Assistant Professor of Higher Education in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. Heather Tripal, Professor and Graduate Advisor of Record in the Department of Counseling. And Lloyd Potter, Professor of Demography and the Texas State Demographer. So again, welcome. And we will take your, top, uh, your questions related to the following topics. So the benefits and limits of distance learning, addressing San Antonio's digital divide, what does quality remote learning look like? What are the long-term impacts of this shift uh, to online learning for this, for this particular semester? How struggles with online learning can impact mental health for students and their families? The pandemic's financial impact to our public schools? Teacher preparation for new modes of learning? Implications for K-12 students and their post-secondary dreams and aspirations, especially our students who are from historically minoritized backgrounds. And as these questions are coming in, I'd like to ask Dr. Ryan um, if she could address just a, a general topic that I'm sure is on all of our minds, regardless of where we sit in this particular situation. So Dr. Ryan, if you could share with us what you believe the limits of technology are as a response to disruptions in education, such as COVID-19, but potentially other disruptions as well. So I think some of the things that we need to think about and that um, uh, Dr. Deli Carpini already um, addressed a, a bit in her framing for us today is some of the things that um, our students with a wide range of needs won't be able to be met just by technology and online learning. So some students needs um, do get met by online learning, but not all. And so some students are struggling in this moment um, to get um, all the services that they generally get in a schoolhouse um, and all the different um, uh, folks who um, take care of those particular needs. So that might fall under the, um, the what we generally think of as special education. Um, and so that's a really important piece that we haven't had a lot of forethought about. And we had to kind of quickly move um, and take care of uh, kind of the immediate needs. But that takes a lot of, uh, of forethought to sit down and come up with a plan. So that would be the first and foremost uh, thing that we need to to sort out. And also the, the piece about digital divide and internet access and uh, device access. And while many of our ISDs have done a great job at getting devices out to folks, working hard to get hotspots, it's not enough. Um, and we really need to make sure that everyone has adequate um, access. So those are kind of the limits that we have found very quickly in this abrupt move. Thank you. Um... And I'd like to kind of build on what, what Anne-Marie, what you talked about and, and um, Dr. Potter, if you could maybe talk a little bit more um, and build on some of those discussions of Dr. Ryan regarding the disparities, the digital divide and sure. how this impact with families. Yeah, so, I mean, certainly um, San Antonio has um, significant income inequality. Um, we're very diverse. Um, city and region, uh, but, but the income inequality that we have also is um, results in, or it's kind of distributed across the, the city and the region unevenly. So we have um, you know, income segregation that also is pretty well aligned with uh, racial and ethnic uh, uh, residential segregation. And so along with that, then you also with income, you know, people at the lower end of the income spectrum would tend to have lower levels of educational attainment. Uh, and then they're finding themselves as parents who have their kids at home and they're essentially homeschooling and they've not really many uh, significant percentage, you know, not really gone much beyond or even beyond high school. And so they're now in a position where they're needing to homeschool or facilitate uh, their student, their kids being homeschooled. And that's certainly the struggle. But they're also at the lower end of the income spectrum and they're struggling with many other things. So they're struggling with 
the fact that they probably need to work because they're probably in a, a, a service uh, industry that might still be open and need workers or manufacturing or some some industry that um, requires them to work plus they need uh, the income to pay rent and buy food and that creates other challenges as well so um, certainly if you're living at the lower end of the income spectrum having access to food. I mean, we've see, all seen the newspaper and the pictures of, of the lines uh, of people lined up for the San Antonio area food bank. Um, you know, so, so there's definitely people struggling uh, and that's likely to continue and, and it creates real challenges for families. And I think, you know, one of the other elements is, is we, if you look at San Antonio, um, the number of people per housing unit uh, it tends to be higher. So you have crowding in houses and many of us probably have seen or experienced because we've all been on video and you know, people walking behind and um, dogs barking, kids um, needing attention. Uh, you know, so it's a distracted environment for the kids as well as for the parents. And so, so how we manage all of that, I think, is certainly something we've learned a lot about here in the last month and a half. Uh, but we still have a lot more to learn and certainly going into uh, the fall if it, in the event that we still are largely online hopefully we'll be much better prepared as opposed to it just being something we jumped into and did the best we could and tried to get through the rest of the semester but hopefully we'll be much more thoughtful and systematic in the process by which we uh, deliver online education support families that are in the situations that I was just talking about and ensure that um, that kids actually um, don't get left behind in terms of, and don't delay their educational attainment as a function of uh, this disruption that we've experienced. Thank you. Um, and that kind of perfectly sets the stage for one of one of the questions from our participants and um, this would really be aimed, uh, I think, at do for Dr. Tripal. Uh, the question is how um, how can we consider and support the mental health needs of our teaching professionals and the families of students going through these changes as well? Um, these were abrupt changes and not by choice, by necessity. So that creates, um, along with what Dr. Potter was talking about, all of these uh, issues impact and have potential to impact students and families' mental health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to start with one word, stress. <laughs> stress is a, a normative response to a, a changing situation and everyone reacts differently. And this can affect the mental health of our educators, our children, teens, parents, and caregivers. You know, as we don't know what the future holds, we do have some data that families across the board are experiencing mental health concerns, calls to hotlines have increased, as well as prescriptions for anxiety medication, you know, fear and changes about health and safety can be overwhelming and cause strong emotions in children and adults. Um, our daily structures change and our safety and security needs are so important. For children and adults, you know, they watch, children and teens watch the adults in their life for cues about how to respond. And it becomes important. So school provides that structure and those um, connections without that structure in place, um, kids can feel, un times can feel uncertain. We also have this sort of perfect storm of economic uncertainty and health uncertainty and economic disparities. And that can create a really combustible environment in some homes. We know that domestic violence and child abuse, for example, are also on the rise. So the question was about support. I think that our school districts are all in this process of managing how do we do that. Many of our school counselors um, have been doing an amazing job, you know, navigating this new terrain, learning how to offer services online, reach out to parents, reach out to those families um, and children who they haven't heard from on assignments, making sure that the meals, as Dr. Potter said, are still continuing, is that's another you know, form of food insecurity, is another social determinant of health, and having that basic need met supports our mental health. The Bear County um, Department of Behavioral Health also has a wonderful website with many resources about mental health concerns, as well as some of the other things mentioned, the San Antonio Food Bank, um, 
hotlines, crisis lines. And so I would also offer that up as the community comes together, you know, looking at our mental health professionals, both within the school, outside of the school, and our other resources that we need to make sure that people have access to that information moving forward. Thank you. Um, we have another question, um, and this, I think, perhaps I'll direct it to Dr. Ryan, but then also Dr. Tripal, you might, I think your input would also be helpful um, from two different perspectives. And our participant asks, how can we um, monitor and reduce the impact on children who have IEPs and 504 programs in our schools? And for, for the broader audience, um, those are, those are um, educational plans for students who have been diagnosed with disabilities in the school that impact their learning? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I think that um, this is a really unusual time, right? So um, I think the most important thing is communication with the team that you're working with at your school. Um, so I don't know if this uh, particular question is coming from an individual who is working with their own student um, or a more generalized question, but in either case, I would encourage uh, people to work with their school, with their contact person at the school, and uh, that team of teachers uh, that um, is working with their student to see if, um, you know, what is it that really those core objectives that need to be met um, and how anything needs to be modified uh, going forward. I think. Um, I would really build on what Dr. Tripal was saying about this is a very stressful situation uh, on families, on students, on teachers and schools. But I would say one of the things that I've seen come out of this particular situation is a tremendous appreciation for teachers and the professionals, um, not only teachers, but social workers, counselors, all those folks from the school um, staff um, and related professionals who are supporting students. Um, and um, I think it's really about working with that team closely and your, um, uh, that, that particular liaison that you have to make sure uh, that the services that you can get, you are getting, and the things that you aren't getting, uh, figure out what the plan is to, uh, to modify those. Thanks. Dr. Tripel, I guess just to kind of follow up on that for you, from your perspective, school counselors are primarily the leads and deeply involved on the IEP process and the 504 process. So from a perspective of how those professionals are managing and how they may be interfacing with families, um, just some maybe some discussion on that. Sure. So uh, to echo on what Dr. Ryan said, you know, um, students with special education needs may be particularly at risk due to disrupted schedule. And so part of those needs are delivered and they have a, a safety and security in what happens at school and how the services are delivered. Now that they are at home, families are having to manage new territory <laughs> with trying to figure out how do I look at the changes in my child and what do I account this for? Is it for changes in their educational environment, changes at home, some combination of both of those? And school counselors and other helping professionals such as you know, the um, occupational therapists and physical therapists, many people who are sort of forming that system along with educational teams can help families navigate what are some of the you know, behaviors we're seeing? How can we best work to support those educational goals? And also our social and emotional learning is important as well. And so I think this is a role where school counselors can talk to um, parents and other caregivers about the feelings and managing them as well with the stress and anxiety in the situation. And so again, I would echo that importance of the team and working with all students at this time. It, the team, the support and social support is so increasingly I think we've come to see as important and relevant. Thank you. We have another question from a participant um, relating to preparing educators. And the question is, remote learning has a long history at higher, and, and it says high learning facilities, so I'm guessing higher educational facilities. Aren't colleges teaching future students this mode of instruction as they pursue their degree? So Dr. Ryan, I'll kind of 
um, send that to you, Dr. Ryan is our the department chair of the, our department that primarily houses our teacher certifications. Mm -hmm. um, and I can also comment on that if mm -hmm. you'd like. Sure. I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, I'm also happen to be a historian of education. So I'm just going to I'm going to throw in a little history. <laughs> um, this isn't the first time that education has been disrupted, folks. Um, and what's interesting about this is um, just for some context, back in the 1930s, uh, polio uh, sent kids home and we educated by radio. So um, teachers have done this before. We've, we've used technology to reach out to students. And in teacher preparation, we've always had whatever the technology was available to us, we've had to learn what that technology was. And yes, we do prepare teachers to use technology um, and we use technology as a tool. It is not um, at the center. It is one of the things that we use to, to teach. Right now, as we speak, UTSA um, student teachers, and I'm assuming others um, out there who are student teachers in other institutions, are actually supporting uh, teachers by teaching online with their students. So yes, we do prepare teachers to do this. Uh, but just as any kind of teaching, whatever the strategy might be, some teachers are going to be more proficient at it than others might be. So this is something we do, but it is one of the tools in the toolbox. It is not the tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, uh, I'll let um, Dr. Deli Carpini. Yeah, I, and I, I agree with all of that. We are, our curricula across our programs are aligned with national technology standards. Mm -hmm. um, outcomes in most of our courses require our arc teacher candidates to be proficient with instructional technology from a variety of perspectives. Um, I think one of the different, the, one of the differences here is that, as Dr. Ryan said, we use that as a tool, an instructional tool. The expectation this school year was not that K-12 teachers would be completely teaching in a remote setting. Um, and we also, speaking to both Dr. Tripal and, and Dr. Potter's uh, replies earlier, we're not really, as a society, we were not set up in our homes to, to have a home environment that focuses on your sitting at your computer, which maybe you don't have, logging onto internet, internet that maybe you don't have, and having a very structured learning environment. Um, we're we're working to ensure a quality education through the end of the school year so students uh, experience student success. But I think what we're experiencing right now is different than if we had a long time to plan for a completely online experience for our K-12 students. Um, so I think it's a combination of things. Um, we, we have a question about um, what can we as faculty, UTSA faculty, staff, and ITC museum educators do to support teacher, families, and students? And what do teachers need from their community partners? That's a great question. So um, I think um, either Dr. Villarreal or Dr. Sanson might be able to speak a little bit to that and others as well. Yeah, sure. I think uh, one of the big things that uh, we're trying to do in the field of higher education is try and use our scholarship and our expertise from um, our faculty members and try and get uh, information that normally you would have to um, pay uh, to access um, in a journal or a book. We're trying to get, get it and make it for free or at least as accessible as we can to the broader audience. I, I do want to say being a subject matter expert, particularly on institutions that serve uh, minority uh, student populations like Latinx, like Black student populations, like student veterans, and I could go on, um, but institutions that have critically served and researched um, these particular populations are going to be of utmost critical impact in these times when there's a shift um, due to a pandemic or any kind of of way of taking us out of our norm. The reason being is because as Dr. Potter kind of alluded to, the demographics of the United States are changing. We know that this will be the majority of our um, population across the United States. 
um, particularly when it comes to K through 12, which Dr. Potter could speak way more than I can about. Um, but this is why these institutions are gonna be so critical and the faculty um, are gonna be so critical. I think this is also where we can discuss about how policy can play into this. Um, so I'll handle, hand that over to my uh, colleague, Dr. Verial, um, but why uh, these particular institutions are gonna need support and funding to get their scholarship and broader message that can help the greater good and greater population and regional contexts like UTSA in South Texas. Um, that's gonna be something that we're gonna have to bring to the forefront as faculty and researchers and scholars um, in our field. Mm. Well, well, thank you. <clears throat> you know, to answer the question in terms of like, what can community partners do? Um, I think this is a time for all of us to reflect on what is essential. What are, what are we trying to really do here in caring and educating and developing the next generation? And how do we need to change the way we do things? Um, I, I think this is an exciting time uh, in some ways because we see uh, our, our educators and our educational institutions really hustling uh, doing a whole lot of experimentation and and adapting to to this crisis and we're going to learn a lot coming out of this and i think ultimately we'll be stronger uh, in in many ways because of it but this is a time to reflect and figure out how can we do what we do differently and in response to these circumstances because our kids need us they need us more than ever uh, if we have seen anything during this pandemic, it's this. Our schools, our public schools, K through 12 and higher ed, these are the organizations and the people who are working to level the playing field in this very unequal society of ours. Our schools from K-12 to higher ed truly are equalizing institutions, <clears throat> and we can't take them for granted. Uh, they, they have a heroic job to accomplish in helping nurture the next generation. And, and, um, and this is the worst time to cut, but to, to move the discussion into the public policy realm, if history is any lesson uh, during economic downturns, mm -hmm. education is one of the first to be cut. And so this is also a time not just to take care of our families and, our, and, and those around us, but also to realize that our policy leaders need to hear from us because they're gonna have to make decisions about how to prioritize a reduced pool of money for public services. And, and, and we have to do everything we can to, to get it right. Um, we, we in higher ed in Texas, we have not yet recovered from the cuts that happened in 2008. And this recession at this moment in time is deeper and more dramatic than what happened in 2008. And so uh, we really have to engage not just privately within our friends and families and neighborhood networks, but if, if we really wanna take care of those we love, we, we also have to realize how interconnected we are and the decisions being made at the state capitol are going to impact us directly. Uh, and so what are my predictions <laughs> if, if, I, if I can get out on a limb? Um, if the political leanings don't change, uh, we can expect a cut in education, K-12 and higher ed, mm -hmm. anywhere between 15 and 30%. Um, last go around in 2008, public ed was cut around uh, 7%, higher ed was cut around 14%. Um, of course, higher ed doesn't just rely on state funding. We also rely on donations and endowments. And, and, uh, and both of those streams have also been uh, harmed during this period as they were in 2008. And so <clears throat> uh, we need to brace ourselves. We need to do a lot of scenario planning, but, but most of all, um, I think now is the time 
to communicate to our representatives who represent us the urgency and need and role that we play in equalizing our society and educating our people so that you know we, we can have a, an economically mobile upward bound community. Thank you. Um, it, your discussion just reminded me back, you know, when I raised my children um, back in New York a, a long, long time ago, our public library used to have a sign because in New York you vote on your library budgets. And the sign was, um, libraries are more important than times of no money than money is important in times of no libraries. And I think that we can stick public schools, mm -hmm. higher ed, <laughs> K-12, and replace libraries as well. So um, mm -hmm. I think that you bring up some critical points. We have a question um, about another po special population. We talked about students uh, with disabilities and students with special needs in, in the educational setting. We have a question about other gr another group of students we've not discussed is the gifted and talented students. Uh, especially those who, uh, for whom engagement might be an issue, um, engagement in the educational experience, mm -hmm. um, because it's not targeting their needs. And I guess that question, I guess um, both Dr. Ryan and Dr. Tripal, but then also my own field is English as a second language. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another special population. What are we doing with our English learners and our bilingual education students in this environment too? So maybe address the, the, the participants question about gifted and talented and maybe then some general discussion on, on different populations of students. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll go. So, so my, um, even though I used um, the example of special education in, in this time, I would um, broaden that to say um, there are all sorts of students who have very particular needs. Um, and one of the things w as we talk about it in um, education is differentiation. So if we're looking at gifted and talented students, if we're looking at students with um, uh, language needs, um, students who have a variety of, of specific needs, or um, we want to make sure that we're meeting those needs. And sometimes we can do that with technology. And sometimes we need to be in the same space uh, with those folks. Um, and social emotional needs are would be one of those as well, um, that all students have, by the way. <laughs> Um, so I don't want uh, the answer that I gave earlier to be uh, misconstrued because I was talking about special education students, um, but it certainly applies to all students have needs um, and uh, there's different lenses that we can take. So there's never a one size fits all kind of answer uh, to or approach to student learning. And we have wonderful ways of looking at that. There's the approach of universal design for learning, which means not that everyone gets the same thing, but actually universal design for learning is this malleable way of thinking about teaching and learning so that we can meet the different needs of all students and so that a teacher can be flexible in their thinking about how do I meet the needs of the, the variety of students that come to me each day, whether that is uh, gifted and talented, students with learning disabilities, students with um, second language learning needs, um, all in the same classroom. Um, you can do some of that through technology, but as we talked about, and I, would, I really wanna um, emphasize uh, many of the things that my colleagues um, have said and that I am um, really uh, have been um, struck with um, over the course of my career, but that we're all seeing um, emphasized in this um, very difficult time period is the inequities. Um, they've been there historically, they've been there all along, but um, they're really coming up to um, uh, light right now uh, for people to see. Um, and so that is one of the things that uh, we really need to address. And I think what um, Dr. Villarreal uh, really focused on there is that is going to be one of the things that we're gonna have to keep the press on as people wanna cut. Um, so as those things come, um, we have to be at the table to say, no, we've seen the past, has the past is prelude folks. Um, we've seen the great depression, 
we've seen uh, through the Great Recession uh, that we will not be able to meet the needs of all these different student populations if we're not there saying we can't go backwards. We have to not only go forward, but we also have to make sure uh, that we take care of what we've never taken care of, which are these historic inequities for historically minoritized uh, individuals and groups of people. Dr. Tripal, do you have anything to add to the special other populations? Yeah, I also think we have a diversity of students in our school systems looking at our LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. population, looking at those who struggle with substance use and abuse, mm -hmm. um, those who are in vulnerable situations at home. I don't want them to be left out of this discussion of the different types of learners. Um, you know, also schools, that place of connection where students explore um, dating and relating to other people. So we have a lot of different things that the structure of school provides. And thinking about how all students are served and how all students learn, you know, I kind of want to go back to that basic Maslow hierarchy of needs of safety and security. You know, the structure of the students' days and the routines have been affected. Their sleep is affected. That can affect motivation. You know, work being due in different formats. Some districts go once a week, some are doing Zoom, many on paper packets. Um, I'm a parent of three teenagers at home now, one in middle school, two in high school. So this is my own home. And I watch all three of my children struggling in different ways. And, you know, I'm an educator and I specialize in counseling and myself, I, I don't know how to respond to all those needs that each has differently. And so I think to kind of go back to that first step of thinking about, you know, social and emotional well-being is important as we look at the different diversity of students that we're serving across San Antonio. And let me follow up, because um, there are a couple of things also dealing with this. So maybe Dr. Sansone, this is related. Um, what resources can students access? Um, so now looking at that transition from high school to higher ed, um, as they matriculate into higher education in this COVID-19 era, and if we're specifically looking at students from historically marginalized backgrounds like dreamers or first generation college students, what are we doing for them and what resources can we make connections for these students and their families? So one of the things that we're going to have to think about going back to the question of what can institutions um, as an organization to include the staff, uh, faculty, and administration as a whole, what can we do to support students just across the board? Um, we really are going to have to work within our power um, of institutional organizational power to see how we can help navigate some of the systems and the structures and the inequities that our students and their families don't have much power to work against. I'll give you an example of that, but federal financial aid system is, is a system that you apply, but what you get is gonna be very dependent on the policies that students don't necessarily have that much say to, to move or transform. And so institutionally, I really wanna call on higher education institutions to begin to think about the inequities that our students are already uh, living with. Uh, clearly, we've, again, we've talked about it, but if I can be a little bit more blunt uh, with some of these inequities, we're talking about racism, we're talking about structures of classism, we're talking about uh, structures of you know, ableism, all of these things that historically we have dealt with here, particularly in this city, um, and have developed these educational systems around. Uh, you know, I'm not a K-12 expert, but I am from San Antonio, and there's a reason why there's so many school districts in this city, um, as compared to New York, where, you know, other states and cities where there's not. Um, so students are coming out of these, uh, these systems that were created under these foundations. Higher education institutions are going to have to start to think and reimagine the ways that we can serve our students particularly those that have very little power. You pointed to students who um, are dreamers. Um, we're gonna have to advocate for them in terms of DACA policy. We're going to have to look for ways that we can fund them in the power structures and the state systems that we're operating in. Um, but again, it's really gonna be a calling to the institutions to begin to reimagine new ways of admission. So these institutions, um, whoever they will are, will be the ones who will be successful. And I wanna call, out, you know, um, 
that it's not just four-year universities, it's community colleges, it's junior colleges, those rural colleges who are the only institutions serving a large population across Texas. Um, we are gonna have to think of new ways to redo how admissions and even student success play out across the board. You know, we talked a lot about K through 12 and their abrupt changes, but it hasn't missed us as well. Um, my colleagues can all attest to the fact that we've all moved online too with our lectures and structures, and it's been um, probably slow going for us as well. Um, so these are things that we're having to navigate, but I'm happy to see that we're challenging ways that we've always said it's historically been this way, um, but we're operating and thinking about new ways to uh, reach our students and give them access to things. I do wanna call out something very specific to our city. We have uh, wonderful programs, outreach programs that students can access beyond their K through 12 resources. But San Antonio Education Partnership is a wonderful city funded initiative that is giving college access services online, Spanish speaking services too for um, those populations that maybe, um, you know, English is a second language, but also you want to work with somebody maybe that really has a good understanding of your culture and the part of the city that you're from. Great organization. Um, there's other organizations too from each college and university that talk talking about outreach. So I'd really encourage students to not um, forego all those processes that you have to do anyway, like fill out your financial aid forms, fill out um, if you're deciding to live on campus, but really reach out and work with institutions and vice versa. Institutions are going to have to reach out and work with our community. Thank you. So I have three questions that are kind of very similar. So I'm going to frame them into one so that we address the three of them. And then I have another question relating to state level cuts and I'll ask that one next. So these three questions kind of, um, if I were to frame them, um, they, they're asking what would an ideal fall look like for K-12? Um, and how do we envision instruction being impacted going forward? So things like physical classrooms, athletics, dining, fine arts, how are these things going to be impacted? So basically, um, what, is it, what, what will an ideal plan look like given our current contextual structures? So um, we have a couple of perspectives that we could ask this from. So um, I'm going to go to Dr. Ryan, and then I think Dr. Potter, and then maybe Dr. Viara can, uh, kind of address the different aspects of these questions. So sure. Andrew, if you want to start. Well, I think um, a little bit of this is unknown in terms of, um, you know, what the policies that, um, you know, city, state, county officials are gonna um, deliver to us. So, uh, but let's assume that some level of on-campus learning happens. Um, it might be a mixture of online and on campus. Um, things that I have been thinking through is um, it might be something like, um, and people might be familiar with this, but when we had overcrowding in schools, uh, we had things like double shift, uh, where different groups of kids come in at different times during the day or different days of the week. Um, or you might do something like when we had year round schooling and kids were on different schedules, the A, B, C, D schedules. Right? Uh, so we've done this before in, in the pre-K 12 model of schooling. So we, we have the skills to figure this out. I mean, this is what's comforting to me as a, as a teacher educator, as a, t as a former secondary teacher and a, historian is we've got lots to work with. Uh, there are things out there where we can kind of go to and say, we've done things like this. It doesn't mean we have to do exactly what we did in the past, but we can kind of do a remix with what we know works best for students. And what I would say is no matter what we do, it has to be best for the children in our care and for families because um, those are the things that drive me as an educator is who we're working with, um, the communities uh, and, uh, and the students and what works best for learning. So, and then we have to be really clear about what is it that we're trying to accomplish here? What are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve? So um, we have to, and I know a lot of people are really, the other thing I wanna get, get to in this question is 
people are really talking a lot about what have we lost? What have we lost? I am really wary of that um, statement because I think as much as this was an abrupt change, as much as there is this, um, the fear about what we've lost, I think there's a lot that we want to learn about what, what students have learned and what they've gained. Um, I think that we need to think, ask really different kinds of questions about what this experience has meant for students. And um, they've learned a lot of technology skills, I'm just telling you right now. Um, they've learned maybe some different things. Um, and maybe that's okay. And maybe we need to rethink about what we're measuring. And, the, and, um, and I would love for uh, some folks to be thinking through that um, in some way, some different way of thinking about that. But so that's a little bit of what I've been thinking about in terms of what the schedules could look like. Um, maybe it's a blended um, approach to the, to the fall. I'll stop there and let somebody else jump in. If I could dovetail on uh, Anne-Marie, uh, I really appreciate uh, your reframing of uh, what's important and recognizing that um, how we measure learning in the past uh, has to change and, and maybe the right question is, so, so what did you learn during this period? Mm -hmm. Not how much did you learn or how much did you not learn? And, and we're hoping to, to find uh, answers to these questions. We're about to uh, be in the field within a week, surveying uh, over 2,000 students and parents, and then another 1,000 educators from K through 12, plus five community college uh, uh, student populations and educators. And because this is a moment where we, we have a lot of ideas, but we've never really gone through this type of experience in this way, uh, certainly not in modern times. And we, we have a lot to learn. And, and that means for us, trying to systematically collect data, or to put it in another way, listen to our students mm -hmm. and listen to their parents and listen to our educators to hear how they've experienced this, this required distance learning. What were the circumstances that they had to live through? Uh, what are the trade-offs that they made? What did they like about distance learning? What did they not like about distance learning? And, and, and so I'm really, uh, in some ways, excited about what we're gonna learn uh, because this is an opportunity to reset old practices and assumptions that had not been reevaluated in education. Mm -hmm. Lloyd, maybe just to sum this up, um, yeah. you could kind of how does this impact families, these new normals? Well, I think probably before I jump in there, I think one of the things that we've not really talked about is are we going back in the fall? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a pu whole public health Mm -hmm. element to this as well. I mean, certainly, I think everybody wants to get back. We want our lives to get back to normal. We want things to kind of be similar, even though they'll never be the same as they were before. But we want them to be similar. But then there's there's this issue of uh, transmission that, you know, we put people close together, and especially kids. I mean, you think about, you know, elementary, kindergarten kids, it's going to be hard <laughs> to kind of keep them from um, I'm, I mean, there's a lot that can be done, and certainly there are strategies to try to employ um, to try to limit um, transmission. Um, but but then there's also a lot of indication, for example, that children don't really have many symptoms associated with this, and so they could actually be infected and then go home, living in a household with um, uh, older people or so on. Then there's transmission there. Um, and then another element of this is the fact that there are going to be children that are, um, you know, um, health compromised, like that that for them to go into the classroom is going to potentially, if they get infected, they're going to be at much higher risk for a really negative health outcome. And so how's, how are we going to accommodate that? How are we going to identify kids that are as, have asthma or which I, I realize we probably have that, but again, there's, you know, there are a whole range of issues that we're going to need to manage if we go back to the classroom. 
in terms of uh, it because the the uh, the infection is not going to go away. I mean, there's going to continue to be the pandemic. It's going to go into the fall. Um, we're we're right now doing this experiment where we're all kind of now reopening the economy. And you know, I'm praying that we're not going to see a spike in in infection occurring as a function of that. But certainly, if we if we all go back, if our kids go back to school and and the university's open, we're likely to see something happen like that. And and again, the, those things are also likely to impact uh, households that are at the lower end of the socioeconomic mm -hmm. spectrum much more hard than they are people that have more income. So I'll stop there because I've seen some of my if, colleagues if I, would like to jump in. Well, if I could just piggyback and, and say uh, a couple of things. Number one is that right now what superintendents are doing is scenario planning. So there, there's no uh, one most likely scenario. There, they, there is so much uncertainty. They're, they're having to figure out, okay, how do we return under conditions X, Y, and Z? And right now, I just want to point out that our rolling seven-day average of new cases is the highest it has ever been. There are more new cases right now as we're opening up than there were <clears throat> when we decided to close. And so I haven't quite figured out the logic of this, except that um our our political leaders are are willing to let uh more people die and and realize um that that this is just going to be something that is acceptable and i i i think it's really short-sighted and um this is no time to let up if anything it's a time to recognize we are in more danger today than we were three weeks ago. So the likelihood of us returning to some type of similar situation in August, I, I think it's, it's really bonkers. <laughs> it's not gonna happen because we're not doing the things we need to be doing right now to allow for that to happen. Yes. Like containment, like testing, like tracking. Great, thank you. And so, very large issues. I'm going to I'm going to answer a question because um, I don't think any of us on the panel actually have the answer, but we've got an idea. Um, and one of the questions is from a participant says, um, as a middle school teacher, I was shocked to see the three hundred million dollars in cuts that the governor in Ohio announced today. Are we looking at the same soon in Texas? So um, while none of us here are operating in that budgetary realm at the state level, we have obviously been impacted the same, you know, in, in different ways, but we have been impacted up economically as a state um, from the need to close a lot of our businesses due to the virus, but also because of another issue, which is our oil revenues. So I think that um, we, I, I know that our state legislatures and our, our governor and our system, um, our chancellors across our systems are working very hard to look at what that future is going to look like. And as institutions, um, we will all be responding, I think nationally to a reduction over the next couple of years and, and doing that in a way, I know at UTSA, um, our approach to any reduction, whether it's a reduction of, because of lowered enrollment or it's a reduction because of this, this global pandemic, is one that really centers and situates our core mission. And at UTSA, our core mission is student success. It's supporting faculty to do research that has an impact on our communities and our state and our nation and our, and our world. And it's it's providing opportunities for innovative growth um, and for access to students. And as a community engaged institution, UTSA has a commitment to our communities and our communities are largely defined. Um, they are our K-12 partners, they are our neighborhood communities, they are community organizations. So unfortunately, um, I wish we lived in a perfect world and responses to budgetary challenges were never part of our world, but they're not. But I have confidence in our leadership at UTSA, as well as our leadership at the system and state level, 
to work collaboratively so that we can go forward together um, in a way that centers those core missions and and continues to support them. So it's not a complete answer to the budgetary question because I don't, I'm not, nobody's talking to me about that. <laughs> um, and then we have a question, I, I think we'll have one more time for question, uh, a very a quick, well, there's one quick question that I think I can answer. And that is the, uh, I know Mike, you spoke about the uh, survey and will those results be available? And I think it's a simple yes. Absolutely. And the way we're going to, uh, clean the data, analyze the data, and do the write-up is we're wasting no time. Our first memo is going to come out in June, and as soon as they're ready, we're going to be bringing them out because our education leaders are making decisions today, and they, they need quality information. And that's going to be available to the public on our website. Yes. And then we have another question, um, and this is very specific about how does this impact STAR testing? And again, I'll answer because it's a fairly quick question um, or a quick answer or perhaps a, a complicated answer. But um, the Secretary of Education, um, uh, Nancy DeVos, has given schools the ability to have waivers for standardized tests if they're unable to um, administer them this particular spring. So moving forward, we will continue to, you know, get guidance from the federal uh, Department of Education as well as states on how how those will be um, dealt with. And then finally, this is not a quick question, but it speaks to, and then we'll just answer this and go to our concluding comments. I'll give each of you a chance to frame something uh, quickly. But um, our homeless populations and what are some special uh, ways that schools might be working with them? Um, I don't know, Lloyd, do you wanna take that or do um, Anne-Marie maybe, maybe Lloyd? Um, well, certainly uh, homeless populations um, are a challenge. Uh, San Antonio has been pretty progressive in terms of uh, recognizing it and addressing it through uh, Haven Through Hope and kind of the, all the other partnerships of uh, uh, nonprofits across um, the city and the region. Um, but again, if you have homeless families um, that are um, not in a situation where they can easily access um, information about school, much less the internet or devices and so on, uh, that continues to be a challenge. And certainly we've seen, you know, a, a fairly, I think, surprising percentage of students that have been lost uh, you know, through this period where we're, that we've, the school's kind of lost contact with them. And certainly mm -hmm. the homeless population is probably a, a, a proportion of that, but there are others as well. Mm -hmm. Now, Anne-Marie might have something else to add. Yeah, I was just going to add that I know that um, SAISD has done a, a, a pretty aggressive outreach to get laptops into students' hands. And I think those students, I think they got to about over a little over 90% of students uh, without devices. Um, but there's a certain number that they just, you know, uh, couldn't get to that 100%. And obviously, that's going to be students um, who either uh, they've lost the, the contact information or it could be um, what we're talking about now, homeless population, but they have also done a pretty good job at those hotspots and, and food distribution to try to reach students who may not be um, actually in a stable living environment to be able to get it um, at locations that might be convenient for, for someone in that particular kind of living situation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's really a great answer to what's being raised here, but I think it's, it's one of the things that has to be on the table when we talk about inequities of, is how do we, um, as a society, this is not all on schools. I mean, I think that's what we haven't talked about is that we're really doing this through the school lens, but this is a social issue. It's a societal issue. I think, I think we all um, are kind of assuming that as we speak um, in, because we're so deeply in the research about this, but this is a, a wider social issue that schools um, tend to um, carry on their shoulders. And, um, and schools historically in the 20th century have become uh, the social institution that um, where we tend to kind of focus on these areas. And that's kind of a, a result of the progressive era, but we have, that would be a whole nother hour. Yes. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you. And I
I think that that's a good way. I think that's kind of a summarizing statement. Um, we are, we all are responsible for addressing the problem from the different places that we sit and the challenges that we're facing. Um, I want to remind our viewers that this community conversation will be available as an archive on the UTSA coronavirus website. And I want to truly thank the panelists for being here today. Um, you all bring a great depth of experience and expertise to this topic. We could do hours and hours more on this topic, um, but I, I want to also thank the audience for your engagement, for your participation today, for your great questions. And I, um, I know that this is the beginning of a dialogue that we will all be having and we will all be collectively solving problems together. So thank you very much for being here to our panelists. Thank you to UTSA for creating the space for this discussion. And thank you very much to our participants. <laughs>